Well, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Whoever you are, wherever you find yourself on life's journey, whatever way you're joining in worship today, whether it's here in this space or online, whenever it is you are taking this in, you're welcome here today. Part of our weekly service involves the Lord's table, and so if you're joining us online, you might want to get some bread and juice or wine to have with you so that you can participate a little bit later in the service. Well, we're in this season of Thanksgiving. I don't know if you've noticed that, but um, every day just feels like the same, right? But still the calendar is there and we're coming up to Thanksgiving, which is going to look real different this year in terms of ways we gather and celebrate. But the season of Thanksgiving is still a rich one for us. And especially as people who follow the Lord, who look to God for life and hope and all the rest of it, we have a lot of reasons to be thankful. So I want to suggest that as we get underway this morning that you just pause for a moment and kind of name a couple of those. We won't do this out loud, but just for yourself, if you want to jot this down on a piece of paper, you can do that. But why are you thankful today? And I won't ask for specifics, but um, can I just ask for a, a yes, no, a, a thumbs up, thumbs down? Are you thankful? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. that, that works. That works, right? Um, you know, we said this before, and we hear this around us, too, that in this season, in this time, as we're thinking about this virus, we focus so much on what's being taken away, what we don't have, our losses. And so it helps us from time to time to pause and say, yeah, but what do we have? What is here? What is still true? What's still good? And to remember that as people of faith, we can look to God and say, thank you. Thank you for what you give. Thank you for your stability. Thank you for your ongoing love and grace. When we gather together like this, we have an opportunity to focus our thoughts in that direction, to Think about this God who loves, this God who cares, this God who steadily provides, who knows what we're going through and has what we need. And so I invite you to join me now as we pray together to open our service in this way. And God, as we come to this time, we're looking to you to meet us here and to remind us of your goodness and grace. So please, speak to us in ways we can understand. May our hearts and minds be open to what you have for us. God, may you receive our thanks for your good care. And now we ask your blessing on our time. We commit, commit it to you with thankful hearts. Amen.
everybody's faces here this morning and welcome to those who are joining us online. Um, we welcome you to this worship service and invite you to join with us. Hardly think. 
strength that's who he is and as one of his children sometimes we forget that who we are that we are loved by him so this is where Michael just kind of loses his like his brain just disconnects right because this God who's perfect, completely perfect, looked at me and said, I love you. And that's who you are, Michael. I love you. Sometimes I think I'm just not worthy sometimes just to stand in his presence. But yet I am because he said, I love you. And come into my presence, come in to where I am, so that I can love you. It doesn't matter what you're going through, what you've done. This God, who we've heard stories about, grown up with, can have a personal connection to you. You're a good, good father, Jesus. That's who you are. You provide for me when I, when I need it at the time that I need it. How many times can you say that God showed up just on time? It's happened for me several times. He showed up just on time. Thank you, God. Thank you so much. Thank you for being good. Thank you for being that sustenance, that provider. Thank you for that. Your heart is kind for all your goodness. 
Yes, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name and sing. God we worship is the one that invites us to come in prayer and to bring before this God matters large and small. So let me encourage you to pray with me now. And we're going to do that. We're going to start with large. We're going to work our way down to small. So Lord, as we look around the world and we're connected to the world through the screens and the news and the papers that we read and God certain things touch our hearts we want to bring those before you now God help us to understand how big you are and that nothing is beyond your ability so we join our voice with that of others. And then we look closer to home, the people in our networks, in our neighborhoods, where we work and go to school. The needs among these people. Some are sick, some are struggling with money, some are wrapped up because of relationships. Some are facing decisions. Some are dealing with memories. And some are dealing with hopes. God, bring wisdom and strength and patience and peace and healing and insight and 
faith. We pray for the church, God, for those who gather in your name around us here in this area and even more widely. God, may your people be effective in living for you, to your glory, for the good of many. We pray for this church as we're thinking about ministry here and into the new year, as we're recognizing new ones who will step into areas of service. I think of those that are connected with this church and yet in distress of one kind or another. And we pray, God, for ourselves that more and more we'd be trusting you, that we'd be walking with you, that we would be wanting what you want, that we would be finding real delight in you. And so, God, we bring our thanks that you're dependable, that you're faithful, that you're great, and that you're good. We put ourselves and each of these other issues and people into your capable hands, trusting your love and your mercy and your strength. So we have a really long passage in front of us today. And if you got one of those programs, or you downloaded one, you'll see on one side of it, the scripture text from Matthew 25. It's really long. It's this interesting story that Jesus tells. It's one of several that he has been offering to the people around him while he's in Jerusalem. And remember, this is just days before he's going to be arrested and taken to the cross. He is still thinking about people. He is wanting to be around them. He is wanting to teach them. He's wanting to um, help them understand more and more about God, which is important because there are a bunch of voices in Jesus' time that are offering ways to think about God. There are the religious leaders and the Pharisees who, when they think about God and when they talk about God to other people, it has to do with a checklist. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to remember. Here are the rules to follow. We still hear that kind of reasoning today. Well, God is like this, and you have to do this in order to stay on God's good side, and if you don't, boy, God's gonna just whap you. Jesus, for his part, when he wants to talk about God, he decides to tell stories. And we've seen a couple of those stories already. We're seeing another one today that he tells about um, a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability. And then he went on to the journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, you entrusted me with five bags of gold? Look, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'm gonna put you in charge of many. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, you entrust him with two bags of gold? See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered. So I was afraid. And I went out and hid your gold in the ground Look, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. 
so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered? You should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10, for whoever has will be given more, and they'll have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness <clears throat> where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is telling these stories. This is one of several that he uses to describe the kingdom of God. You notice that the way this one begins, again, it will be like. This puts it in the context, in the series of these parables about the kingdom of God. And as we listen to Jesus tell these stories, we recognize a certain number of surprises in them, like the notion that part of the kingdom, part of the reality of the kingdom is that the king is coming back to gather all and then to judge, to look into each heart and to say what is true. There is a coming day of judgment and that can surprise us and perhaps worry us. It's not necessarily easy to hear either. And there are those that find themselves judging God for being a judge. But as we listen to Jesus talk and as we think about what else we've known about God and learned from testimonies of people we trust and portions of scripture that we believe to be true, we also see this running theme of God's goodness, that God's dependable, God's steady, God doesn't act capriciously. The stories that Jesus tells help to get us ready for what's ahead, but they also encourage us to bring what is true of this kingdom, this kingdom that God is going to establish fully and finally, where all will be well. As Jesus tells us about that kingdom, he's also inviting us to bring that into now, to live like what's gonna happen there is true right now, to adopt the values and the ethics and the perspective of that kingdom today. So Jesus is not just interested in the future. He's also talking about right now, our present lives. And he does that with these stories like this one about this merchant who goes away and before he leaves, he decides to distribute his wealth among his employees, his servants. And so he gives bags of gold, right? That's what they do, I guess. Five to one, two to one, and then one to another. After a long time, the master comes back and calls the servants in and says, okay, first guy, five bags. Hey, I got five more for you. To which the master says, nice going, well done. Come and share your master's happiness. Next guy comes, he'd receive two. He says, hey, you gave me two, here's four. Well done, good and faithful servant, nice going. Pat on the back, high five. Come and share your master's happiness. And then the third servant comes. You gave me one, here's one back. Because I know your game, I know what you're like. You're harsh. You demand things that aren't yours. You have expectations that are unrealistic. I know, you, I know what you're like. To which the master says, you have missed it here, buddy. That's kind of a paraphrase. And as a result of that, things are going to happen. Now, I'm gonna to get to that in a moment, but <clears throat> for as long as this parable is, it's still short on details, right? I mean, what motivates this guy, the master, to give his money out like that? We don't know that from this story. Where does he go? We don't know that either. And then what is it these servants do to get this kind of return. I mean, to get a 100% return, anybody, that would be amazing for anybody, right? But what do they do? We don't know. So let's focus on what we do know out of this story. Let's start with the bags of gold. Our translation gives us that word. If we were to go into the Greek, we would actually hear about a measurement of weight, an amount of gold. And the students of the scriptures tell us that 
the five bags of gold, if you had one bag of gold, that was the rough equivalent to half of a lifetime of work, your income from a half a lifetime of work, all right? So if you get five bags, how many lifetime incomes is that? Two and a half, all right? That's two and a half lifetimes of working. Two bags of gold, how many lifetimes of work is that? It's one, one lifetime. One bag is a half a lifetime, two bags is a full lifetime, all right? It's a lot of money. And then for the guy to get five bags and bring back five bags more, now he's got 10 bags of gold. This is five lifetimes of income. That is a pile of money. And we might think that this story is about money, but it's actually wanting to make a bigger point. I mean, when the master looks at what the first and the second servant have done, they have doubled their money. His response is, well done, good and faithful servant. Nice going. And then he says, you've been faithful with a little. Now I'm going to put you in charge of many things. You've been faithful with a little. He's been given 10 bags of gold by these guys, five lifetimes of work, and he says, eh, that's just a little stuff. Let's talk about things that are really important. That's perspective. That's perspective. All right, so that's the, the bags of gold. The stress here is on the faithfulness of these servants who have used what they were given to produce something else. They understand that this is what the master's about, and they have bought into that. The third servant, however, a different situation, and now we get a little more dialogue from this one. He starts off by just handing the one bag back and says, I know what you're like. You're harsh, and so this is what I've got for you. Well, the first thing we ought to ask is, how good is this guy's information in terms of knowing what the master is like? Because as we've been introduced to this master, this is the guy who gave out his wealth to his servants. That's the first thing he did. And then when a couple of the servants did well, he was very quick to notice that and commend it. Well done, good and faithful servant. And then he says there's a blessing. Um, you, I'm going to put you in charge of many things. That doesn't sound like a blessing. It just sounds like more work, right? But that's often how it is. If you're, if you're good at work, your reward is often more work. Right? I had a friend who used to work for, um, for NASA down in Maryland. He was an engineer. He was a really good engineer. He could do anything with his hands. And so he was, an, he was engineering stuff at NASA. And he kind of came to the attention of his bosses. And they said, you are such a good engineer. We're going to make you, in, we're going to put you in management. And he came to me one day and he says, I just want to be an engineer. I don't want to manage people. He made the mistake of being very good at what he did, and so he was just given more responsibilities. And he figured it out, he eventually became a pretty good manager too. All right, so that's what this master is like so far. Nice going, and here's some more work, because obviously you like to work, so I'm gonna let you do more of what you like to do. And then the third thing is, come and share your master's happiness. He says, hey, let's celebrate. So does this sound like the picture of someone who's harsh? Now, th this third servant has got it wrong. He's got, an, he's got an idea. It's passionately held, but, but he's wrong. And now the master comes back and kind of senses this and says, okay, so you knew this, right? You knew that I'm harsh? Then at least you should have done something to appease me at least get interest on the money, right? That's, that's the logical move that you're gonna make. You wanna keep my, my harshness away from you. And really, what the master's doing is calling this guy on his claims because he hasn't followed through on his own statement. And probably what we've got is this guy just kind of admitting, uh, recognizing that he has failed, but being unwilling to admit his failure. And so you do the classic, the classic jujitsu move, right? If you've got a problem, you blame somebody else. It's not my problem, it's your problem. You're the problem, not me. The master's not having it. And then that takes us into um, the hard part of this parable. 
right, verses 28, 29, and 30. So the master now says, all right, we're going to take that one bag you've got and give it to the other guy. Whoever has will be given more. And they'll have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. So the master gave this guy something, pretty fabulous wealth, right? Pretty significant. Guy doesn't use it, doesn't, just buries it in the ground, forgets about it, right? Gets taken away. For a birthday or a Christmas some time back, I was given by one of my daughters um, a bar of really nice chocolate, right? And if any of you like chocolate, you know that the right kind of chocolate bar is a pretty good gift. And it's the sort of thing where you say, I am going to save this for just the right occasion. So I took the chocolate bar and put it in my desk drawer and saved it for the right occasion. So every couple of days I'd open the drawer for something and I'd see this thing in there and I'd think, no, not now, not now, later, later. Because I don't, I don't get into immediate gratification, right? I can delay my gratification, no problem. And so, you know, every couple of days I'm opening the drawer, there it is, and then after a while, it's a little more time going by, and then, you know, it's that drawer that collects stuff. And so now the chocolate bar is buried, it's just out of sight completely to the point where I've lost track, and now I'm getting other things out of the drawer, and, and this thing is just underneath and whatever else is accumulating. Until finally, a few months later, I, for whatever reason, knock it back, and there it is. And I think, oh, maybe it's time open it up, and you know what happens to chocolate when it's been sitting for like six months? It's not a good thing. Uh, <laughs> so this item that I'd been given with, you know, a, a good heart, I have just thrown into a drawer and forgotten about. And so what I had is basically taken from me. It's of no value anymore. And because of the way I've treated it, I haven't given it any value. And that's what the master's saying to the servant. I gave you something of value. You just ignored it. You put it in a hole in the ground. And that leads him to this next line. Throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When Jesus talks about the day of judgment that's coming, when God gathers all, looks into every heart and says what is true, there are going to be those who have aligned themselves through faith with God. And God's going to say, come, let's go. You're going to be with me forever. And there are going to be those who just refuse God, that just stand against God and say, nope, don't want it. And for those, it's separation. A separation that gets described in various ways through the Bible, but this is one of them. It shows up a few times in Matthew. We actually hear this in some other literature outside the Bible from a similar time, point in time. This weeping and gnashing of teeth. And when you think about this and couple it with darkness, what you have is a picture of something that is opposite to God. Where God is, it's light, not dark. Where God is, it's a matter of joy and peace and calm and stability and security. It's a matter of, of being, that all is well where God is. Weeping and gnashing of teeth is, a, is a, a description of where there is just anguish and stress and upset. That's what this story is telling us. You refuse to take what the master gives, you refuse to come and be part of the plan, then the separation. Well, that's the story. What do we do with the story? Well, a couple of things. One, we want to be remembering what has started Jesus talking about this telling these stories, and it's been the questions about what's going to happen? When are you coming back? Those questions are raised a little bit earlier, and in response, Jesus tells these stories about what the coming day looks like, the return of the Lord. So we should begin our understanding of this story by realizing that there is this coming day when the Lord returns, when everything gets made new, and judgment is part of this day, judgment when God looks into every heart and says what it's true, and we should not imagine that day will not come. 
You always want to be careful when people use too many negatives. Don't imagine the day won't come. Put that in the positive. That day's coming. Live like that's true. And that's where we go next, that between now and then, how do we conduct ourselves? We engage in the business of the master. Now, when we look at these servants, the one who made the five, the one who made the two, the, the two guys that were able to double what they'd been given, we're not told what it was they did to get there. You know, it's possible they made some wise investments in the stock market. You know, they bought Microsoft back when Bill Gates was still in high school. Or they, they found some art. They found some artist who was just beginning and they said, oh man, you know, it's the next Caravaggio. Or they were trading in durable goods or they took some online courses and learned some new skills and were able to use those to generate a lot of cash. We don't know what they were doing which is interesting because that's not the point, a particular kind of action. The teaching here is that it's something, something that the master wants to be done. Because the master's given something and expects for that to be used. And that's the, another of the lessons that emerges from this, that as the master gives, we want to be asking, okay, what has the master given me? What resources has God put at my disposal? We think about time and money, and we all get some of each, right? Change, the amounts vary from person to person, but we all get some of each. There are opportunities and connections. There are abilities and interests what do you do with these gifts? What do you do with these things the master gives? Well, you can bury them in the ground or you can just throw them in a drawer and sort of ignore them and say, eh, I'll, get, I'll get to it eventually, or I won't. You can squander these resources. Jesus tells another story about a son who gets wealth from his father and then goes out and uses it all in his own pleasures. That's fun for a while, but in the end, just pretty much turns to dust. Or you can use what has been given to the glory of God. You can engage in the master's business with the gifts that God has given. And I think about what that looks like in our day. So this past week, Christian Churches United, one of these organizations that we support here at St. Thomas, they had their fall fundraiser. And they were talking about the kinds of ministries that they've been involved in and they are involved in. One of those is helping homeless people in Harrisburg. That is a, um, that's an expensive proposition, right? To open places and provide housing for people. So there's a place for money. Think about what's going on here at St. Thomas. We have ongoing expenses to carry out the ministry in and through this church. There's a place for money. What about time? Well, in these days, visiting people, calling them on the phone, offering to drive for those that don't get out, those are ways that we can invest time that we've been given. Maybe we build something or cook something because we've got those skills and those abilities. Maybe we open doors for someone else because of people we know. We put people together. We help situations develop. There are all kinds of ways of using these resources, but it starts with that basic view of the master. Is this someone I'm going to serve? Is this business I'm going to engage in? Jesus is raising those questions with a story like this one, and they're questions that we want to consider as we anticipate the coming day, but live as though that's true right now, being engaged in the master's business, the master who is coming back and is going to be looking at us and say, so how did you live? What did you do with what I gave you? Powerful questions. 
And like so many of Jesus' stories, um, they, don't, they don't end neatly. It isn't like, here it is. But rather, these things get into our brains and they just keep bouncing around, raising more questions, but also nudging us in particular directions. So maybe we be people who are attentive to stories like this and hear what the master is saying. You know, I'm actually going to take just a moment now, and if you've got a piece of paper handy and something to write with, um, you might want to jot down a quick note, and otherwise you can just do a mental, a mental scribble. But think about what gifts God has given you. What resources has God put at your disposal? It's not a time to think about, I wish I had, or how come they have. It's more a matter of, what has God given you? And as you ponder that, then the, the follow-up question is that, to that is, and what are you doing with that that shows your connection to the kingdom? We don't want just to read these stories and let them pass by us. We want them to lodge in our hearts and affect the way that we speak and think and act. As we come to this portion of our service and consider, uh, as we think about this master who gives, that's a, such a great lead in to the Lord's table where we find expressed in these simple things, the gifts of God. In the bread, we see the body of Christ. In the cup, we see the blood of Christ given for us, wonderful gift from God. We include communion in our service each week as a way of focusing our thoughts, as a way of remembering what's at the core of our faith. What's the central story? There's lots of stories. What's the central story? And it's here. Our need God's grace, our benefit, God's glory. It's all pictured right here. And so as we prepare to eat and drink, we're going to pause before that happens for two things. One, we're going to acknowledge ways that we have turned away from the master and have said, nah, not that interested, or have just gotten distracted by other things. And then secondly, we are going to remember the gifts of God and give thanks for that. So let me lead us in a prayer and then we will eat and drink together. So Lord, as we look at this table and as we see the bread and the cup, we're mindful of all you have done on our behalf. And we also consider ways that we have turned away from your kindness and your guidance. And so we ask your forgiveness for the slippage, for our conscious decisions, for our indifference. And we thank you, God, that you do forgive, that you are quick to receive us, that our sin has been cared for because of Christ's sacrifice. So we look at this bread and cup and we say thank you. Thank you for the faithfulness of Jesus and going to the cross. Thank you that through this death, life is possible for us and for so many. We ask your blessing on this bread and cup as we eat and drink together that we might in this simple act 
remember you, and in remembering you, live to your glory. Amen. So when he was with his friends, Jesus took bread. He broke it. He passed it around the table. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Remember this as you eat. took a cup from the table and said, this is my blood. My blood that's been poured out for you to forgive sins, to show that a covenant made with you is in force. As you drink from this cup, remember me. Loving God, for these good and gracious gifts, we say thank you. For the life that is ours because of the death that Christ endured. Strengthen us, we pray, to live with our eyes on you, our hearts aligned with you, our very lives in your hands. Amen.
today. A couple of things about this week ahead. We have an online study Wednesday night when we're looking at some different Old Testament characters. You're welcome to drop in. 
And then next Sunday, we have a little bit of a change. We're going to have a single service at 9 o'clock in the sanctuary. It'll be a a traditional service. And that'll be a time of giving thanks. So if you have something you want to give thanks for, would you jot that down and send me a note this week or give Carol a call or email it to the office? Then we're going to read a bunch of those as a part of our service next week. And then at noon next Sunday, we have our annual meeting. We will be electing new people to serve in consistory. Paul Hepler and Missy Schmidt as elders, and Kristen Bianchi and Bill Miller as deacons. So that'll be part of our time together. There are poinsettias that you can offer, order if you would like to contribute to creating the building. And that's all the announcements. So, a final word. The same power that we've been singing about, Peter talks about that in the first chapter of the second letter, where he says that God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. As we go out into this day, into this week, and whatever this time holds for us, let's bear this in mind that God's divine power, God's divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Let's trust that to be the case. Let's show that to be true as we move. Amen? Amen.